Hello and welcome to The Fix, a podcast about Photoshop, Lightroom, post-processing, and the cool and creative things we get to do with our images after the shoot. I'm Sean Duggan, your host, and this week's show is a bit of a variety pack. Our main topic is going to be taking a look at layer clipping masks and layer clipping groups and some of the cool things you can do with those, such as targeted adjustments to specific layers to some cool compositing effects. And in a follow-up to last week's show, where we covered the new guided upright feature in Lightroom CC, we're gonna take a look at the implementation of guided upright in the Adobe Camera Raw 9.6 update for Photoshop CC. Stay with us. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. Thanks for tuning in, I appreciate that. Uh, so as I mentioned in the intro, um, we have kind of dual topics that we're covering on this week's show. The main topic we're gonna to spend the most time on is uh, layer clipping masks and layer clipping groups, which is an essential layering skill that if you're not already familiar with it, you're gonna be glad that you learn about it in this week's show because it does have a lot of really uh, useful and cool applications, both in terms of just normal image adjustments you might apply uh, to some interesting uh, effects that you can use in compositing and kind of uh, design type projects. But first, we're gonna start off with taking a look at a new feature in Photoshop and specifically in Camera Raw, the uh, raw processing plugin that it, comes with Photoshop. Now, that feature is the guided upright feature for uh, applying uh, perspective corrections to images. I covered guided upright as it pertains to Lightroom in last week's show, but I didn't really have time to go in and take a look at how it uh, is implemented in Camera Raw. So that's what we're gonna do here. Now, uh, as is often the case when Lightroom is updated, um, there frequently is a corresponding update to Adobe Camera Raw, and that was certainly the case here. That is uh, Camera Raw 9.6. And um, we're not gonna spend too much time on it. It's gonna be pretty quick, because I did spend a, a lot more time on Guided Upright in last week's show. So if you haven't seen last week's show, and want to see how Guided Upright works in Lightroom and also see how it works on a variety of different images. And I really kind of play around with it a lot and, and spend time exploring with it. That's last week's show, episode uh, 070. But for this week's show, what we're, we're going to do is just work with a sim single image and go in and see how Guided Upright works in the new Adobe Camera Raw 9.6 for Photoshop CC. Let's take a look. All right, I already have an image open here into Adobe Camera Raw 9.6. And this is actually uh, from one of the same locations that I showed in last week's demo. This is the old Idaho State Penitentiary in Boise, Idaho. And what I'm gonna do first, let me actually just click my green uh, button up here to expand this to fill the entire screen so we can see what's going on. So the first thing I want to do is I want to come over here to the Lens Corrections tab in the Camera Raw Controls. And I do want to make sure that I turn on Remove Chromatic Aberrations and Enable Profile Corrections. And that last one there really is key because it is going to ensure that the Guided Upright feature has all the information it needs to do a good job at applying the upright corrections. Next, I'm gonna come over to the toolbar in the upper left and choose this new tool, the Transform tool. Now you can also get to that by choosing the shortcut of Shift T, which I will do right now. That enables that tool. And then over here on the control panel on the right side, we have our usual controls. So I'm gonna turn on the guided upright, which is this button right here. And then it basically works the same way as it does in Lightroom. The main difference here is kind of the interface and how it's laid out. But other than that, it's gonna work you know, the same way. Now let me just point out a couple of useful shortcuts here. One is you can choose Shift-G to turn on a grid. 
And there's also a checkbox for that down here at the bottom of the panel. And you can change the size of the, the grid squares simply by moving this slider right here. So Shift-G is going to turn the grid on and off. And then the other thing which is useful is the loop. Now there is a loop view down below here, or rather a checkbox for the loop, but there is a shortcut for that, and that would be Shift-L, and you can see that that turns this loop on. So the purpose of the loop is, of course, so you can really see to uh, line it up accurately there. I'm just going to use this window here, or, or rather this uh, kind of vertical edge here of the architecture surrounding the windows. And I'm just going to drag out a line there and just kind of align it there with that base there. And just as with Lightroom, you're not going to see anything happen until you define a second edge. Now for this, I could come over to, to this window here, but I think I'm going to use this edge of the building right here. And I'm going to just click and start to drag out an edge there. Now this edge of this building here looks like it's not totally level here or, or, or totally vertical. It looks like it might be a little bit wider at the bottom. So I'm just going to leave it set like that. The cool thing about this is that after you have dragged out lines, you can adjust them after the fact. So let me actually hide my loop here. I'll just do Shift L to hide that loop. And I can come here and grab this circle handle here and I can change that. So I can modify that to see what that's looking like. Whether I want to come in like that or out a bit. Oops. I accidentally did a horizontal lines there. So that is selected there. I'll just press delete to get rid of that. And now I can come over here. I definitely do want to keep as much as possible of the bottom um, of the image underneath this little kind of picket fence here. I don't want to crop that off. So I think I will come in a little bit closer there towards that, that pipe that's right there. There we go. That looks, that looks pretty good. So overall, uh, that's pretty much all I need. I don't necessarily need to put a horizontal guide in here. Uh, of course I could. Um, one thing to point out here is just to try not to place it on uh, lines that are not truly horizontal. So for instance, this um, top of this brick wall here where this large steel door is in set into, you know, that is actually a slanted wall. I do remember that from being there that it kind of slanted down. It was like kind of on a little downhill grade. Uh, but this line up here on the top of this building is a lot more likely to be a, you know, close to a horizontal line. So that would make a little bit more sense if I wanted that horizontal line there. Of course, it is um, kind of cropping in on the image here. Now, one thing that you can do is that you can um, command option or control alt drag to reposition the image inside this canvas area. And then the other thing you could do is use the scale slider here to scale it down. So if you don't want it to be cropping off you know, so much, you can scale that down there like that. I'm actually gonna get rid of that horizontal line. I don't think it's doing uh, anything significant there. So I'm just gonna get rid of that and I'll scale up there as much as I can. And then once again, I'll hold down Command Option or Control Alt on Windows and drag to reposition this here. So something like that looks looks pretty good like that. And that is all we need to do. So basically, it's working very similar to how it works in Lightroom. Uh, just a little bit of difference in the layout. And of course, there's some slight differences in the way that the guidelines look. If you don't want to see those guidelines that you've dragged out here, you can use the shortcut of just V to hide those guidelines. No shift key or anything, just V will hide those temporarily. So overall, I like that. Um, I think I have plenty of room in this image to uh, crop it without adversely affecting the overall composition. So I think what I'm gonna do is get the scale slider here and just scale this up a little bit here until we uh, can crop off that one edge here on the right side and then of course I can use that keyboard shortcut of command option or control alt drag to reposition this and again of course the one thing that I really wanted to keep in there was that picket fence and I need to scale this up a little bit more there we go that looks pretty good and let's command option drag to scale that up to make sure I'm getting 
all of the bottom of that picket fence there. All right, excellent, looks good. I'll just click open image here to bring that into Photoshop. And there it is. So that's a, a quick revisitation of the new guided upright feature, uh, specifically as it is implemented in Adobe Camera Raw 9.6 which is part of Photoshop CC. And again, just a clarification, you do have to have the Creative Cloud version of Photoshop in order to have access to this new guided upright feature in Camera Raw 9.6. Okay, onward to the next topic, which is actually the main topic for this show, and that is using layer clipping masks and layer clipping groups. So for the exploration of clipping masks, I prepared a quick little demo file here. Let's just take a peek at it to get a sense of what is going on here. We have a background layer of a coastal scene. This was taken in Hawaii on the island of Oahu, and this was taken near Makapu Point, for those of you who have traveled in that area. A really beautiful, beautiful part of the coast. Of course, most parts of the coast in Hawaii are pretty beautiful. And then I have this clock, and you can see here if I turn off the visibility for the background layer that the clock is surrounded by transparency. And that is a key important concept here because it is the idea of transparent pixels and non-transparent pixels that work to create the clipping mask effect, as we shall see here shortly. Now, probably the most common way you might use a layer clipping mask would be if you had uh, a multiple layered file and you needed to apply an adjustment to one of the layers, but you didn't want it to affect the rest of the image. So for instance, if I come down to the Add Adjustment Layer button in the bottom of the Layers panel, and I'm just going to click on Hue Saturation, and I'm going to move the Hue slider around to change the color of the clock, well, that works quite well. Of course, you can see that the color of the clock is changing, but of course, the color of the oceanscape below is changing as well. And that really is not what I had in mind here. Uh, so that is, that's a bad thing there. That's, that's a technical term. It's a bad thing. So uh, fortunately, there's a really easy way around that, and that is to just use the layer clipping mask effect on this adjustment layer. The easiest way to do that when you're working with an adjustment layer is to use this button down here at the bottom of the properties panel for the adjustment layer. Now the properties panel is where you get the controls for the adjustment layer. So you can see here are my hue and saturation and lightness sliders for the hue saturation adjustment layer. This very first button uh, in the bottom on the left hand side is the clipping mask button. So if I click on that, You'll notice that now that change in color is only being applied to the clock and it's not affecting the background layer. A couple of other things to notice here in terms of the, the architecture of our layer clipping mask effect, and that is in the layers panel, you can see that the hue and saturation layer is indented a bit and there's a little arrow pointing downward at the clock layer below, and the name of the clock layer now has an underscore or an underline underneath it. So those are the visual cues that there is a layer clipping mask effect in place here. So essentially what is happening is the shape of the clock, which of course is determined by all of the transparent pixels around it, the shape of that clock is determining the visibility of the adjustment layer. So the effect is only being applied to the pixels on that layer, and the transparency is creating a mask, essentially, and preventing it from affecting anything else. And of course, because it is tied to that clock layer, I could move that clock around, and the effect stays with it. So this is really cool. This is um, an effect that I like to think of as masking without a mask, because we are creating a masking effect, but we're not having to actually create a layer mask here in this uh, empty layer mask thumbnail that's attached to our adjustment layer. So what's happening is the uh, transparent areas on the clock layer 
are essentially acting as a virtual mask there for that effect. So that's pretty cool. Now, the other thing we can do is I can add another adjustment layer. So let me just come and click on the Add Adjustment Layer button in the bottom of the Layers panel. This time I'll choose Curves. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to brighten up the highlights just a bit and darken down the darker parts. Essentially, you know, a, a, an S curve here to create a contrast effect. But of course, it is not clipped, so I do need to click on this Clipping button here in the Properties panel, and now that is clipped there as well. Let me actually unclip that and show you another way, or actually a, another couple of ways that you might add the clipping mask effect. The first would be to come up to the layer menu and choose create clipping mask and that will do the same thing. I'll just undo that. Now notice that there's a shortcut next to that menu command. It's option command G on a Mac or alt control G on Windows. That will create the clipping mask effect if you like to do those things from the keyboard or Method number three would be to put your uh, cursor here on the border between the two layers, the layer that you want to clip and the layer below that you want to clip it to, and just hold down the Option key on Mac or the Alt key on Windows and you'll see your, your cursor will change to the layer clipping mask icon there. And then you can click. And now it is clipped to the hue saturation layer, which in turn is clipped to the clock layer. So that is what we have now. This is a layer clipping group. We have a group of layers that are all clipped together. So that's pretty cool. All right, now let's move on and explore a couple of other ways that we might use the layer clipping mask effect. I'm actually gonna come in here and double click on the hue saturation layer to modify this a bit. And let's kind of get this to a, a different color. We'll make it green. I kind of like green there. That looks pretty good. And maybe lower the saturation just a bit on that. Okay, that looks good. All right, so I have up at the top here, I have a text layer that says vacation time. It's summertime here, so it seemed, seemed a good thing to have there. Let me actually move the clock layer down a bit so it's not up so high. Something like that looks good. And then up above the clock layer, I have another layer, which is just um, ocean surface detail. Now this was actually photographed not far from where the, the main ocean picture was photographed. Um, but I kind of like those colors there, and I like the, the fact that we can see the waves and the, the texture of the surface of the water. What I want to do is I want to have this ocean surface detail picture appear inside the letters of the type layer. And with a, a layer clipping mask, that is easily done. So let me use the shortcut here on the keyboard, which again is Command Option G for Mac or Control Alt G for Windows. And now you can see uh, that with no work at all, I have the texture of the waves and the ocean surface appearing inside the type layer. So that works really, really well. And this is actually one of the, the more kind of classic type of effects that you might use the layer clipping mask effect for to place uh, a photograph inside text so that the photograph shows up inside the text. See that quite often. Uh, if you're going to try that out yourself, uh, it's good to use text that is, you know, fairly bold and blocky. So you have plenty of, of room for the photograph to show up inside it. You can imagine that if I had, you know, kind of a wispy cursive type font or typeface here, that there really wouldn't be that much area for the photographic detail to show up within the letters. All right, let's move on and do something else here. Let's bring in yet another layer. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the curves one layer to make it active because I want the new layer to come in on top of that. And I'm going to go over to another photograph that I happen to have open, also taken in Hawaii. Got a Hawaii theme going on here. This is on Waikiki Beach, and um, the blurring effect that you see here it comes from the fact that I was using a Lens Baby to do this shot. Lens Baby is a really interesting selective focus lens that gives you kind of a sweet spot of focus in the center, and then everything else gives you this really interesting 
uh, blurring effect. And in it, you know, you can apply blurring effects in Photoshop, of course, but um, oftentimes you can get effects with the lens baby that it would be very, very difficult to achieve uh, in a post-process applied blur. So I have my move tool active. I'm going to drag this image up onto the name tab of my main file and down into the image. I'll hold the shift key down to center that and it adds that layer. So you can see the layer is on top of the curves layer and the hue saturation layer which are already clipped to the clock layer and I'm just going to now add the surfer layer into that. So let me actually rename that. I'll choose surfer. And actually I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this surfer layer into a smart object because I know I'm going to want to scale it smaller because I want the surfer in the center there to appear inside the clock and I can see right now that he's way too big to fit inside there. So I'm going to make this a smart object so I can have flexibility once I do scale it smaller to be able to scale it non-destructively. So I'll just right click on the layer here in the layers panel and I'll choose convert to smart object. All right, so now that that's converted, I'm going to put my cursor between the two layers, between the surfer layer and the curves layer there. Hold down the option key on Mac or the alt key on Windows until I see that little clipping symbol. And now you can see that the surfer is clipped inside the clock layer. So that looks pretty good. The first thing I'm gonna do is maybe play around with a blending mode so I can get the, the surfer picture to blend in so I can see both the surfer picture and the clock at the same time. Now, of course, I could come up to the blend mode menu here and choose a blend mode, but here's a cool shortcut. If you have the move tool active or a selection tool, uh, just as long as you don't have a painting tool active, if you have the move tool active, you can hold down the shift key and then tap plus to cycle through the blend modes down below. Now, if you want to go backwards, just hold down the shift key and tap minus several times and it will go backwards through those blend modes. But this is a nice uh, way to kind of take the blend modes for a test drive. If you're not sure which blend mode you want to use and you just want to quickly you know, cycle through all of them to see what they're looking like. I kind of like that hard light. Uh, vivid light works good, but it's maybe a little bit too vivid. I like that hard light a lot. I think I'm going to leave it set to that. And maybe I will lower my opacity. And since my move tool is active, I can use the shortcut of just tapping a number on the keypad. I'll just tap on 8 to lower my opacity there to 8. And that lets me see a little bit more of the clock face in there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to transform this layer smaller. So I'll choose my free transform shortcut, Command-T on Mac or Control-T on Windows. And I'll just grab a corner handle of this bounding box. I'm holding the Shift key as I do this uh, to constrain the aspect ratio of the picture so I don't you know, warp it and distort it too much. That's looking pretty good. I kind of like him off to the side there. Uh, I like the fact that there's this nice orange glow behind him. And I also like the fact that the hand of the clock is kind of pointing up there uh, at his face and his head there. So that looks pretty good. I'm going to just press the Enter key to apply that. And now that I've done that, I'm thinking that, well, maybe I don't want the clock to be green. Maybe it would look better if it was you know, back towards the, the reddish color that it started out as. So let me get my hue saturation for that adjustment and play around with this again to see what looks good. Now that I have that kind of orange glow in there, I think actually the, the natural red color probably looks a little bit better for the clock and maybe I'll saturate it a bit. There we go. Something like that looks pretty good. Okay, so there you have it. There is a nice example there of uh, how you might choose to use layer clipping masks to apply an effect to just a specific layer as we see here with the adjustment layers that we have used to modify the clock. Or use it for compositing purposes to have an image layer show up inside a text layer or have an image layer show up inside 
another image layer as we see here with the surfer inside the clock. Now, before we finish off here with the clipping mask, let me just do another quick demo. I'm going to come over to a, another version of this file of the clock and the ocean detail here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, the image or the layer of the clock, and I'll also hold down the command key to select the ocean surface detail, and I'm going to drag these down to the layer group icon in the bottom of the layers panel to put them into a layer group. The nice thing about placing layers in a group is that when you close the group and the group is active, you can move them around and they will move together and you don't have to worry about selecting both of those layers. So the reason I'm doing this is I want to show you that you can also use layer clipping masks with a layer group as well. So I'm going to come back here to the picture of the surfer and I'm going to drag that up to the name tab of this new file that I'm working on. Drag down into the center of the image and I'll hold shift key down and let go, and that will drop that in. So in this case, holding the shift key down is just centering the layer that I'm adding in the middle of the file. So I'm going to use the shortcut of holding down the Option key on Mac or the Alt key on Windows, and putting my cursor between that new layer and the layer group, and clicking, and you can see now that that has been added into that shape. And so now I have a layer, that is clipped to a layer group that contains two other layers and I could have several other layers in this group and essentially the the new layer would be uh, the the shape of the new layer would be determined by whatever the visible shape of this group is and if I open this up I can get my move tool click on the clock layer and you can see that I can move this around and as long as it is within the boundaries of the new layer I have added it is conforming to that. I think that looks pretty good there, just in the center, something like that. So there you have it, yet another way that you might choose to use layer clipping masks or a layer clipping group with some of your imaging projects. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that and found that to be useful information. Um, I hope that maybe there's already some ideas kicking around in your head as to how you might use layer clipping masks and layer cl clipping groups in your own creative imaging projects. They are really an effective technique and there are a lot of different ways that you can put them to use. Give it a try. So that about wraps up another episode of The Fix. Uh, if you're watching on our website, thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix, there is a box over on the right side of the page where you can subscribe to this podcast. There's also an email list you can sign up for to be notified when new episodes are published. And if you want to get in touch with me and maybe leave a comment about the show or perhaps make a suggestion about a topic you'd like to see covered on a future episode, maybe a guest, a certain photographer you'd like to see interviewed about their processing technique, Click on the Contact Us link up at the top of the page and in that contact form that opens up, make sure you open up the little menu and choose which show you want to comment on. And of course, for this show, that would be The Fix. And send us that message and I'll get that. And we do appreciate all of your feedback. I'm Sean Duggan. Thanks very much for watching. Catch you next week on The Fix. The Fix.